feels um, particularly appropriate, actually, to have after a brilliant, energizing presentation about creativity and how to do it better and work harder to have uh, two brilliant creatives here on stage with me. So um, I'm really, really pleased to be talking about, we're going to talk about um, how to engage the luxury consumer, but the uh, conversation I can tell you for nothing is going to be more wide ranging than that. So I know Charlotte said that our guests need no introduction, but I, I, always, I always think uh, introduction is much more in, uh, about praise and acknowledgement than it is just about an introduction. So uh, Gillian is, uh, De Bono is not only, I think, one of the very finest editors-in-chief of her generation, she's also the editor-in-chief of um, How to Spend It, which is a magazine that has really defined the luxury conversation with uh, an ultra-high net worth intelligent uh, individual in this country for uh, the 25 years since she came to take it on from being a a page in the newspaper, which I think it was in the late 60s, and into the extraordinary magazine and website that you that you know today, and it's won multiple awards. And it's also called, um, I'm going to say it was by The Guardian, so that's just a caveat, the, the, one, the shopping list for the 1%, which as, um, as Supercase goes, quite a, quite a nice one. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Al McKeosh, who, as Charlotte said, is the creative chairman and founder of Sunshine. So who, uh, when he created Sunshine, uh, had a mission to um, really help luxury brands um, unleash their own power to be cultural generators in their own right. And he creates compelling um, and engaging, you're, you're going I to hope. convince everybody, I hope, uh, re, uh, stories for luxury and premium brands. So that, and the ones that you will know really, really well are Harrods, Bournemouth, and Gucci, uh, Victoria Beckham, and that's just a, a very few. So, um, so we're going to we're going to talk about uh, engaging the luxury the luxury customer. And it seems to me that that really, um, you know, that's quite a wide ranging subject. I really want to talk, ask you, Julian, first of all, what in, what does engagement actually mean to you? It's quite a it's, funny, it's a word that's only really come about through digital, really, isn't it? I would say so, although I'm sure it was considered before digital in terms of uh, sort of customer loyalty. But um, now I would say it's about an emotional response, and that's what brands are looking for. And by that, it also means a sort of sense of community and connection uh, between not only the brand itself and that individual consumer, but between the, the other consumers that are part of that sort of tribe who love that brand. So it's having a sort of, a, it's having a heart and a soul, a sense of community, shared values, and an emotional response. And what about, what about you, Al? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, having an emotional connection between a business and a consumer has actually always been at, at a premium. It's one of the hardest things to um, achieve. I think it's a spectrum, however, and you probably get a different answer from every single pe person you ask, depending on their, their role within a business engagement can run from simple awareness, which I mean, Kevin's kind of given us everyone the answer really to what we all need to be doing in this sector with his, his tips and principles, all the way just from basic awareness and saliency in a world of mass abundance and things competing from the attempt for your attention, right the way through to transaction, and then beyond that, because I think beyond straightforward transaction, carrying a little bit of that brand and its story as part of your lifestyle and then telling others about that, that, that it has always been the most powerful form of marketing, I think, has been word of mouth and advocacy. And even though we are now living in a so-called sort of influencer age, there are lots and lots of people influencing one another on a daily basis in simple conversations between one-on-one. -on -one. All my podcast recommendations come from two or three individuals. If my, uh, my partner and girlfriend point something out to me, then suddenly I think better of that. So you can't really sort of industrialize creativity. And I think that's you know, so, so interesting the way Kevin broke that down. Engagement is really specific to that business and the consumer that they're trying to um, build a relationship with. So, um, so I just so. In that context, if luxury is the opposite of utility, you know, or I mean, Chanel said, because we can all, like, I'll see your Chanel quotation, Kevin, I'll raise it. <laughs> <laughs> um, luxury is the opposite of vulgarity. Um, how, do you, how do you stop that engagement becoming commodified? How do, you, or, and how, do you, how do you scale the one to one if that's the most powerful form of engagement in, 
uh, for a more highly realised customer. Well, I mean, it can often be through the sort of mechanism you guys talk about a lot, which is soft power. It doesn't have to be through mass communication. In fact, there are lots and lots of principles from the marketing of you know, to FMCG and, and uh, commodities brands that, that were you to apply them to a luxury um, situation, they might have the sort of the the, the, the opposite effect, actually. I think you have to find the point of common interest, and you mentioned values before. You know, we make most, all of our decisions are, are emotional, whether we are conscious of it or not. We all have a sort of a moral universe and a value system. And luxury is ultimately about identity. It's how we see ourselves reflected in some of the decisions that we, that we make. So when we choose a car, we're not just choosing a car to get from A to B, we're choosing a car that says something about us, both to ourselves and our peer groups, and also to other people who happen to, uh, happen to see the decision that we're making. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that idea of identity is fundamental, isn't it? I mean, you said that, Gillian, when you're talking about hearts and souls and tribes. Give me, give me some examples of... Um, of, of how you've done that with the with the FT. I mean, I don't want to take you back in a time machine to uh, to when you took you took that um, uh, into and made it into the magazine that it is today. But when you were thinking about that tribe, how did you identify how did you identify them, and then well, what did you do? The, the luxury for me as an editor is that, of course, there's a lot of reader research. So uh, unlike a luxury brand who has to think that people walking past this shop and how I'm going to draw them in. I actually start knowing a lot about my reader. And so the one thing I've really drummed into my team is that this magazine is for the reader. It's not for you, it's not for your friends. It's, and we've really focused on who that person is. And the sort of research we have, I mean, I know how, on average how many watches they have, how many holidays they have, where they own a boat, their favorite brands. Uh, where they live and so forth. So that you, uh, we have so much, uh, it, so I have an image of them. I actually think, I actually, ha I can see my reader. I can see my reader. And so everything is, every decision is made around that reader. I mean, I'm sure luxury brands like to think I make decisions about the luxury brands, but it's actually, <laughs> my first and foremost thought is the reader because unless I can actually make them feel this magazine is precisely for them, that magazine is not going to be a success. Well, without, I mean, for the luxury brands, without that reader, there's no, there's no, there's no market. So, yeah. um, I'm glad you're focusing on the reader. I and mean, the reader is an interesting word, isn't it? Because it's one that I would, in my background in publishing, we would use the word reader all the time, regardless of what platform it was. And it's, I'm wondering whether the idea of consumer makes things <laughs> oddly impersonal and it creates a barrier towards that kind of very personalised identification. I wonder what you yeah, have it, to say. I think it absolutely does. I think the greatest learning that I've had over the last five years as we've brought more and more diverse creative talent into our business from an editorial background particularly, but also from the entertainment industry, is that it's, it's the same information but with a completely different mindset. And I think we talk a lot to our clients about editorialising your brand. In fact, if you take Harrods, for example, which is a, a client of ours, the appointment of Tiffany Dark to be the editor-in-chief across the entire media business, there, including having oversight over marketing and communications alongside the CMO, it's bringing that sensibility that, that you have spent a long time crafting and perfecting to making decisions. And, 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 and that makes you very powerful, actually, in as much as the audience have a finite amount of attention and you are on their behalf helping them to make informed decisions about what they'll give that attention to. And I, you know, I sort of think the rise of the curator inside brands, either you know, externally through partnership or actually investing, as Harrods have done, into talent that has that ability and that mindset. Because I come from more of a traditional advertising background where we were trained to reduce everything down to a single message and then repeat, repeat, repeat. That doesn't work. It's not effective, as Kevin pointed out, in the world of luxury. And it's certainly not um, effective in terms of the media landscape as it exists today. I absolutely agree with you about um, there being a much stronger cohesion between marketing, uh, comms, PR, uh, and for, for a brand, and the content, the, ed the editing, because yeah. we don't really have that at the FT, and I've, it's been quite difficult, but I feel I see a press release written about something, whether it's how to spend it or some other communication, and it's just not right. The yeah. tone's wrong, the language choice yeah. is wrong. And um, I mean, they do know now that I, I like to get very involved and often will completely rewrite, yeah. completely redesign. 
uh, because we know our reader better than they do. Yeah. And I wish more, more companies sort of understood that you've got to have a complete, a seamless message yeah. and therefore to have one person who's keeping a, um, a, an eye on that. That's that's right. Right. Yeah, it, mm. it, it's really a sort of a, having an editor-in-chief or that sensibility sitting across all the channels that you're using because you can't really control the order in which people are exposed, particularly mm. with social media. Because unless you're seeing, if you see something in Instagram stories live, then you saw it first. If you see it two days later, then you might have seen five other things in advance of getting that one bit of content. So, I mean, I think work harder actually is probably the, you know, the best slide of all because I think all of us just have to work harder in order to wire all the things together to be consistent and to have a point of view that is going to engage the the, the audience. We talk about audiences rather than consumers and customers because it makes you think about what they're doing with their attention. I mean, consumers is a answers. horrible word, you're yeah. absolutely right. Well, yeah. It's a horrible it's word. Consumer is just feels like yeah. it's like content, it just yeah. it just yeah. feels like a bully. Consumerism is the pejorative. It's very cold, yeah. Mm. But it's the, I mean, think that idea of the of the editor is interesting because we heard earlier, didn't we, about um, how luxury is you know, lu the choice is no longer a luxury because you open the internet in the morning and it's like a messy cupboard and all falls on your head at once. <laughs> Um, simplicity is the luxury, and that that was in a presentation about future trends. But actually, that's arguably what the the role of the editor has always has always done. Um, and I wonder yes, whether you're, 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 you're editing for your reader, you're curating for your reader, and the more wealthy they are, the less likely they are to have time to actually do that editing themselves. Yeah. So the more up market you are, the more you have to distill what's out there. So I want see so when when you're. Um, because really, when you came and you created Sunshine, it was a real revolution, actually, in how people were advertising to luxury brands. You didn't you know, use the same formats. There weren't 17 pages of watches. Well, I love that. You we, went... we, were either, we were definitely brave and probably naive in a lot of instances. But then I think those two things as a spirit actually can often go hand in hand. Um, and if you're asking different questions, there's, a, there's another definition of creativity that, that, that I love, which is from William Plyer, who was the editor-in-chief at Faber for years and years, and he said, creativity is the power to connect the seemingly unconnected. I think the first thing we did was look at the conventions of the category that we were working within, and then say, to Kevin's point, let's not do that. How could we break those conventions? How could we bring another component or element into this that would make it seem new? And that's really the only way to move forward. So we've made life difficult for ourselves because we don't sell the same thing every single time. We look at the business or the brand, we look at the objectives, we even look at you know the budget available has a massive contributory factor on what you're going to sort of come up with and invent. And you really have to start from scratch every single time and do something that is right and different and differentiating for, for that brand. I think I mean, like, I'd love to uh, delve a little bit, if we can, into the, into the work that you've been doing for Harrods, because that's not... That's very unconventional. Harrods is not a brand, apart from there's only one sale that does any right. advertising, and it's all focused. You mentioned Tiff, Tiff Dark, so who, for those of you who don't know who she is, she was, she's a, I mean, a background similar to Gillian in a yeah. way, you know, editor of Style magazine for The Times, and then when went to the US to work in, uh, in more immersive content, didn't you, at A&E? That's right, um, yeah. So, but tell us what your, how have you, how have you approached the work of getting engagement with the Harrods? Um... Well, you know, th th there's, there's a whole number of different levels to that engagement because there is no one customer. There's actually dozens and dozens of different types of customers at different ends of the, the sort of the economic spectrum. But one of the first things we've just tried to do together is bring some energy for those people who have perhaps known the brand and had maybe sort of either fallen out of love with it or forgotten about it. Um, and the, one of the insights we had was there's an awful lot of people who are interested in this area who want to have deeper understanding and knowledge and appreciation for the brands and their stories and just the whole sort of concept of what makes luxury. So one of the first things that we've uh, created with them is a podcast series. And that podcast series is extremely high quality editorial. The uh, partner that we brought in is ex-BBC commissioner. So it, it's, in a way, it's a sort of a luxury product in and of itself. And we're using that platform and those very interesting new distribution channels that podcasting you know, affords anybody who's coming from a point of authorship. And so who would be, who have you chosen to present the podcast and who would be the interviewees? Oh, so Marilla Frostrup is the, uh, is the interviewer and Roxanne Ilyanich, for example, would be a subject that you would, that we have, that we have interviewed. And we're really sort of asking her, you know, to tell us a little bit about her individual perspective on 
on, on luxury. Um, because I don't think, to the point about engagement, you don't necessarily have the same answer for every single equation. What is luxury to me might be different to luxury mm. for you and, and you. So it's really sort of exploring what is it that, on a personal level, defines luxury for, for, for people who uh, have in, influence. So is that, I mean, is that how, how, how true is that, that luxury is very, it has its own completely specific hermeneutic um, bu bubble in which it operates, that the, custom, the luxury customer is just different? Do you, do you, are, are they, is the luxury customer so I, different? I think, I think there's, um, it's very tempting for people to pigeonhole wealthy people. Yeah. They are just as varied as the rest of us. Um, and we've always, I mean, the, the, the range of content that Sorry, I should say editorial. I mean, the features we cover. Uh, for instance, as I say, we do fashion, we do philanthropy, and we also do fishing. Because, uh, but a lot of, uh, I think in, 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 in magazine world, there's been a rather cliched um, image of the high net worth reader. And I still remember the launch, I won't mention the name of the magazine, a, a luxury lifestyle magazine, um, colour supplement launched in the States. And their first fashion shoot was a woman dressed in diamonds and furs, rushing across a tarmac to get in her private plane. Now, you know, it just, it's, it's, <laughs> kind of, it's of so cliche. cliche. And I think that the most important thing to remember is these people are, are, are as, their interests are, ex, are incredibly wide. And one man will, uh, one man will value having a, uh, a, you know, a, a watch room where he stores his watches. Another one will be very happy with one watch, but he will have his, his classic cars. Mm -hmm. Uh, or and you'll have someone who will you know have homes in five uh, different countries, but just not be interested in clothes. So it's very very important that you kind of get into understand them in a way so that they actually feel that they are understood. So try to understand how you do that as individuals, but so to understand them as individuals, then connecting with their, with their passions is that the is that the right? It's, way well, it? it's obviously the, the, the range of subject matter that you cover, but it's also the tone of voice of the writing. Another thing I, I perceived in um, in the early days when we were setting up how to spend it was that, um, and it still happens actually, where uh, an article would be about the rich, and they're called the rich. <laughs> I'd like what, to it's kind of the rich. what do the rich do? Be alive. And you'll be interested to know the rich. Is, I thought if I read that and I was rich, I would feel so alienated. Yeah. And so the tone, and the, we have an inclusiveness in the tone, and we're very careful. You know, cannot underestimate the reader in terms of their intelligence and their particularly wealthy readers and their experiences and their knowledge. So it's pitching it right so they feel that you know they're reading it and it's, it's, it's written by one of their friends or one of their community in terms of the depth of the uh, research, the depth of, of the knowledge that we're communicating, but the tone has to be right as well. We've never, never talked about the rich. It's, you know, because it's so... It, and all, so it, it, it's such a reductive term, isn't it? And it doesn't actually truly true reflect at all how luxury businesses make their money, depending on what that mm. business is. If you look at the success of Gucci under Alessandro Michele, that's not the rich inverted commas that are driving the success of that business. That's a, a huge new audience of people who are using whatever economic power they've mm. got to access that creative world that he's, that, that, that he's built. So it doesn't help, I don't think. Yeah, it's not really a definition of a, an individual, is it? No. Hello, rich person. <laughs> Let's talk to you because you're rich. It just feels immense. I mean, when you say it like that, it just feels immensely crass. Unless we are, mm. But we've all, we've all seen that kind of thing um, happening. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, Alice, a little bit about the work that you've... Um, again, kind of going back a little bit before McKayley to uh, Chime for Change and, mm. uh, and, and Gucci, because that felt for me the very first... You might, you'll need, I think you'll need to explain what, what, that, what that was. But it felt like the first very different kind of way of engaging people in purpose. Well, it, it, it definitely was a sort of a, a, a big step. So this was back in 2013, and uh, the PPR board at the time had been investing for a long time in uh, philanthropic projects that were supporting women and girls and the challenges they were facing. But there was quite a number of sort of confluent trends around this as an issue mm -hmm. taking place in the couple of years before and they made a really bold decision that actually what they wanted to do was to use the power of the Gucci brand to elevate that subject matter at a mass sort of scale. So we were part of the team um, along with um, Kevin Wall and uh, Global Philanthropy Group who um, created that 
Chime for Change, Chime for Change brand, yeah. built its sort of mission around engaging those people who had audience, like Beyonce was one of the, the, the founders of that, and then built a sort of groundswell of support around those issues and put on the, the concert at, at Twickenham, which um, she had uh, headlined. But that, that message carried out to over a billion people in a, in a live broadcast in order to sort of raise uh, a flag out there in culture that this was something that was coming into the mainstream and actually there was permission for people who might not necessarily be you know close to that as an issue that this was something that they could engage with so it actually just um, had had a second um, uh, moment a, a week ago where under his creative direction they've relaunched the, uh, the the brand with a sort of a new focus around a much younger gender generation and and gender fluidity and, and inclusion so it's a good example I think of a brand that has real cachet real sort of sort of cultural power using that power for good and it you know f five six years ago feels like a long time now and i think there's an awful lot of businesses recognizing that they have a responsibility at a sort of a, a social and cultural level and be the opportunity to be relevant we're all in the relevance business because we're all competing for a finite amount of attention it's, I mean, it's really interesting to see that that campaign which was so impactful i remember when it when it happened is having a second a second yeah. life, you know, kind yeah. of... And, uh, well, to, to Kevin's point, you have to keep iterating because mm -hmm. if you start to set patterns, the quickest way to sort of lose relevance and engagement is for people to ignore you. So it is, it is about continually sort of challenging yourselves and trying to move forward, I think. And, uh, and, what, was, and what was Kevin saying about being different? So uh, for people to notice what you do, you have, you have to be different. Is that... I mean, is that... I mean, that's a peculiar thing to, I mean, to, to be creative. That goes for any kind of customer. But what... How different do you have to be with the very high-end customer? Um, well, obviously, it's slightly different for me because I'm not selling a product, but we, we certainly took a very different approach to how to spend it when we launched it. Uh, and because we're, we're competing with other, obviously, other products, print mm -hmm. products, so I suppose we are a sector and ourselves. And so, um, it was mentioned earlier, you, know, you have to have a point of difference, otherwise you won't stand out from the crowd and people won't notice you. you know? So uh, it helped that we were first in the market, because there weren't any luxury lifestyle colour supplements then, obviously, but we chose a very big format, much copied one now, but the only one of that size and that, that sort of paper. And it was a, a case of also thinking what else we could do that would make us stand out from other magazines. And that included only commissioning news and trend-led stories, because that tied in with a newspaper. Um, and also um, making sure that our columns almost became sub-brands, things like uh, This Seat, Perfect Weekend, Technopolis, all have, be have become sort of, uh, have, have, have now become brands in their own right really memorable. So we, we get, went through the same process as a lot of the luxury brands in terms of whether it's designing a new handbag, which is how do you stand out from the crowd? What is your USP? Because you, if you do not have one, you will not succeed. Because quality alone is not enough these days. You know, it used to be, I think, you know, where, where you could get away with just being very high quality materials and craftsmanship. If I hear that term, attention to detail, one more time, <laughs> uh, in, in the context of the luxury market, I will scream. But that's just not enough. It's got to be. You've got to always have your points of difference. And how? And how do you keep that new and new and fresh in a in a con, in a context of so much um, digital excitement? I suppose you know things well, are available to everybody all the time. Um, I have an awful admission. I don't keep an eye on the competition <laughs> because, in a way, I'm not really influenced by other magazines. And that's sort of. I think that's probably a very wicked thing to say. And um, I, I'm not sure I should recommend it, but I think there's, there's this thing, it's talking about consensus. Yeah. You know, there were so many things in magazine land. You know, get the look. I remember editors' picks, all these things, and all the magazines were doing all yeah. the same. We said, we're not having any of that. We're not having it. And we just said, oh, if I can see, and in fact, I used to say in the early days, if I can see it in another magazine, I don't want to do it. Yeah. If I do see it in the magazine, I don't want to do it. And it was just, big, and it was fun. Made made the job more fun as well. See, I I, I totally agree with that as a mm. as an approach and spirit because I don't think it's a case of being different for the sake of being different. You're being different because you want to be distinctive, but that distinction yeah. has to link back to something that is true to what it is that you're that you're mm. trying to achieve. We have a, we launched a, a, a very high end a luxury beauty brand uh, last year called Augustina's Bada. Um, and its story was fascinating because the guy who invented the biochemistry is the professor of 
uh, stem cell biology at the University of Leipzig, so very much alive and well, which is quite unusual to have somebody so prominent going into this consumer product space. And we built the entire brand around him as an individual and his reputation in the, in the science community. And so the brand is called Augustinus Bada, which is his name. Bit of a mouthful, but that's part of the, you know, the, 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 the job of PR and marketing. But then every single step along the way, we've sort of used what the conventions of the category are doing as a sort of a benchmark for where we need to move beyond. So it's not a case of doing it differently because they're all doing it in rent, and that's not true, that is a terrible generalization. But we had our own path that we were trying to follow. So his entire thing is about efficacy. So when it came to creating that before and after efficacy communication, rather than hire a top photographer and create the before and after image, we actually hired Richard Kirby, he's the director of Planet Earth, to bring his camera, which is, can magnify to 50,000 times the, uh, what the human eye can see, and we filmed 27 days of seven influencers trying the cream in the morning and the evening and measured the efficacy of the cream. And that entire documentary project then became the sort of the content uh, hub that we broke up into multiple different parts, the different influencers went off and marketed in their different channels. But it just, it just took a very simple thing like, well, we have to prove that skincare works and approached it in a very different way. We brought a bit of documentary thinking into the beauty space. And what, and, what were the, and what were the results? Well, thank goodness it really works. <laughs> um, to the point where our, our claim is, no, this is the cream that works. But that, in a way, was the risk. There's an inherent risk attached to doing anything new, as oh. Kevin said. But there was such confidence, I think, uh, in the, the team at the, at the brand that this was going to make a visible improvement. We were willing to put that camera onto subject's uh, skin in order to sort of document it. And what would you have done if it hadn't worked? We would have had to have been very honest about that. And that really was, the critical conversation was with the owner of the company about what if it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. And with him and the professor, they said, but it will. So there, there wasn't so their really, confidence led their, their confidence led to our confidence. So there wasn't really a plan B, but we would have had to have been very honest about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. But high risk, you know, high reward. Yeah. So I, I've got a couple of, time for a couple of questions if anybody wants one. There's one there. Yeah, you've got the microphone. Thank you. Hi, guys. Very fascinating. Um, so this is one for Gillian. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot today around Generation Z emerging, and you mentioned earlier on that you have the picture in your head of your how to spend it reader, what watch they wear, where they go on holiday, so I would really, really love to know, obviously they're gonna get older, they're potentially maybe stop spending so much, traveling so much. How are you then gonna tap into potentially their grandchildren? You know, what they're gonna want as readers. Obviously there's a lot of angles here, whether you know, print is still gonna be a big thing, how you evolve the digital side, which is a different matter, but I would really love to know how, how to spend it is gonna start appealing to this new luxury consumer, whether they've inherited their wealth um, or whether it, they are a new luxury consumer, as we talked about earlier on, this 9.9% who are self-made. Okay. Well, I think uh, labels can be quite dangerous. Uh, the idea that as soon as millennials came along, there was a completely different type of consumer. It's, you know, it's a much more gradual process. Uh, my daughter's a millennial. That They are very different too. They get labelled and they're very, very different people too. <laughs> Uh, give one, but I would talk this continuum. What I would say, the luxury consumer is a is a continuum, not a generation and a different generation and a different generation. That we suddenly have to do things very, very differently each time. Change. It's a continuum. So, give an example. We've we've all, we've covered sustainability in the magazine in many different ways, and but particularly in travel for probably about fifteen years because because the baby boomers actually were beginning to get interested in it. Now it's, now it's a major part of the travel industry, as is, as is the wellness part of the travel, in, tra travel industry. And it just happens that the millennials are really, really, really interested in both those things. So it, it's, it's not suddenly a kind of, we, you know, we wake up one day and say, my gosh, we've forgotten about the millennials. Because, because, it's, because consumers don't change that quickly. They change gradually from one generation to another. And the, and the idea that if you're 33, you're thinking one thing, and 39, you're thinking something else, it's just nonsense. It was quite interesting. I read, actually, in, I was editing some copy, and we had a piece on Valentino. And, um, and the designer said that he doesn't think about the millennials. It's quite interesting. And I think that 
you have to decide. I know who our reader is because we research it. We research our reader, and I will continue to reflect what our research shows. And I do meet some readers, and, and I get a lot of feedback there. And the age difference of our reader is changing very slightly, very, very slightly all the time. So, it's, so again, it's just, well, you won't suddenly see how to spend it has embraced the millennial. That won't happen. There will be a gradual, as with anything. Same when, 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 with the recession. We introduced a philanthropy column because that became very, very important. So whenever there's any upheaval in society, you know, it it's, it's, will last for a number of years. And, and if you're sensible as an editor, you actually you, you, you look at what you've got, you think, is that still appropriate? And you make changes. But it's gradual. Yeah. And actually, gradual. the thing that I've taken out of this conversation we've been having over the last half hour is that generalizations are the enemy of yeah. engagement. Yes. You yeah. know, if you want to engage really strongly, then it's about individuals. It's about hearts, souls, tribes about daring to be different and not being afraid to take risks. Yeah. Uh, Julian, Al, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you. Thank you.